This Week in Radio Tech, episode 167, is brought to you by the streaming audio products at the Telos Alliance, the Telos ProStream, a convenient streaming appliance, and Omnia AXE, PC software for professional streaming audio. And now, our feature presentation, Twirt. Into recycling? Keep your old AM transmitter out of the dump and give it to a ham for a complete refresh, plus streaming news and ideas. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, Dad? All your days are belong to us. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Chris Tobin joins me discussing AM transmitter recycling, Google's all access, and our favorite subject, streaming audio. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, welcome in. This is This Week in Radio Tech. Well, the title just says it all. We talk about radio technology. Sometimes we actually talk about what happened this week. And the show is brought to you by Telos. And Omnia. Yes, two companies with some similar products, the Telos ProStream and the Omnia AXE. Both of these products uh, process audio and stream it to the web. We'll tell you more about that in a few minutes because that's becoming a very popular thing to do. I'm Kirk Harnack, the host of the show. I, I do work for the folks at the Telos Alliance, and they let me work there even though I do this show. Also, a uh, co-host that we have with us, Mr. Trustworthy himself, the best dressed engineer in radio. It's Chris Tobin in Manhattan. Hey, Chris. I think we lost him. <laughs> well, he's got a, at least he's got a great look on his face. Did, did we lose him altogether? Yeah, I'm going to reconnect with him. All right, no problem. We'll bring him back. So let me just go ahead and cover a couple things that have been... Uh, uh, I, I hear everything. Oh, you're hearing okay. All right. Do, do we have his video back? I, kind of. I hear everything just fine. So if you don't hear, okay. see me, that's quite all right. Now we see you. We just, just we we you were frozen and we didn't hear you back uh, responding. So Chris, you work at Musicam USA, the best dressed engineer in radio. Go. All righty. Yes, IP codecs, audio and video. That's what we do at Musicam and many other digital things. And I'm uh, coming to you live over LTE, hopefully, uh, from Bryant Park in New York City. So it's actually a lot of fun. So you'll see people passing behind me, maybe alongside me, and maybe stopping up and saying hello and looking for some money. In any case, I'm on location. Outside, actually, uh, just, just a block away from HBO Studios. Wait a minute. People coming up to you and asking for money. How is that different from my house? It's not. You know, when you've got a 17-year-old daughter and, uh, <laughs> and, and a wife. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same thing. Hey, so on this show, uh, we're a very topical thing. The Dayton Hamvention is just about upon us. It's this weekend. Maybe you've been to it. Maybe you've never been. If you've never been, it's the kind of thing you got to go. You, you got to go at least once, even if you're not a ham radio operator, even if you're not an amateur uh, uh, operator. Uh, it's. I tell you, there's just so much cool stuff there. Old equipment for sale, new equipment. There's seminars going on. Those are very educational. I've actually went to a few of those. Uh, and, and it's it's great camaraderie with uh, with your your ham radio friends if if you're into that. And I've been for a couple of years, actually three different years. I think I've been to that. Just not able to go for the past few years. Usually I'm on TV doing weather or something that weekend, like this weekend. Uh, but it is May 17th through 19th, so it actually starts. Uh, tomorrow, if you're watching this live, it starts on Friday, May the 17th, goes all weekend. Um, and uh, it's been, I don't know how many years it's been going on, but quite a few. I guess I could look that up. Uh, it, it, um, uh, you know, the, the purpose of, of, of the whole thing is just to bring ham radio uh, people together in a, um, uh, in, in a convention format. Uh, there's a huge flea market there, and that's what so many people love to go to, to see all kinds of uh, old gear and new gear, manuals. You can buy tubes. You can buy uh, some of the old stuff. is just amazing, especially old microphones and old radios, uh, old two-way radio gear, old ham radio gear. Uh, it just You never know what you find. I mean, I've seen telescopes there, old computer hard drives. I mean, the ones that are as big as a washing machine. It's just amazing what you'll find. Uh, the uh, the uh, website for this, if you want to go check it out, if you haven't been to it, please do. It's at Hamvention. That's H-A-M, Hamvention, like convention, but the con is replaced with ham. Hamvention.org. And, uh, and you can read all about it there. Um, one, one thing that I want to talk about in this uh, uh, show is the things that Ham radio people, people are into that hobby, um, what they use from the broadcast world. And 
one of the things that people really use in, in the ham radio world that comes from the broadcast world is old AM transmitters. Why? Because they make great amplifiers for typically the 160-meter band. Now, maybe they also work on the 80-meter band, and maybe someone in the chat room could enlighten me about that. But um, I certainly have seen them used in the 160-meter band, which is a, a, just above the, the AM band. So to bring us up to speed on this kind of thing, there's a great YouTube video that, uh, that, and, uh, that uh, Andrew's going to play for us. It's called AM 2001 Broadcast Transmitters. Uh, it's a, a presentation for the AM Forum uh, at the Dayton Hamvention that occurred back in 2001. The information, though, is still perfectly valid and, and, uh, and, and, and reliable. So, Andrew, if you could go ahead and run that video from YouTube. It's called Heavy Metal Radio Stations. This is a story about the heavy metal radio station. No, not a psychedelic trip through your mind throwback to the 1960s, but a voyage through vintage radio with retired broadcast transmitters brought to operate on the shortwave ham band. Old transmitters don't make business sense. Commercial radio stations have to worry about the light bill, especially when they're on the air 24 hours a day. They have to worry about replacing obsolete tubes in transmitters like this. They have to worry about fixing old rigs like this. So what do they do with these old transmitters? Well, in many cases, it's out the door. What happens next can be up to you, the vintage radio enthusiast and member of the AM community. Wouldn't it be great if a rig like this followed you home? How about more than one? How about a great big one? Yeah, the signals are very good. Uh, I'm very surprised. The uh, band usually uh, doesn't settle in here uh, for at least another hour. Seems to be lately anyways. And uh, we've... Uh, well, we softened up the 4-125s on the A drive, the Class A on audio driver on the uh, 21. As you can hear, people are on the air with the biggest glass and chrome big rigs you could ever imagine. Where can these transmitters be found? Well, it's not always in a pretty place. Sometimes the retired broadcast rig is part of a rundown, has-been radio station struggling to stay on the air with anything, let alone a transmitter from 50 or 60 years ago, probably dating back to when the station first went on the air. But for anyone willing to put in some time and effort taking out the iron, for example, so they can move one of these things, the reward can be something very unique. I don't know, maybe the EQ doesn't like uh, driving that long, you know, 50, 60 foot uh, piece of twisted pair down to the transmitter. Who knows? But I still got some tweaking to do in this rig, no doubt about it. It's, uh, I haven't taken a uh, SIG Gen to it yet to sweep it out. I haven't... Uh, done any of the fine adjustments on the screen voltage and grid voltage and all that jazz. So there's, there's some finer points that need to be worked out. But we're in due time. Now I better quit buzzarding away here. Steve, WB3HUZ has actually combined the parts from two of these General Electric Model BT20As so that one good one will operate very well, as you can hear, on 160 meters. Sometimes it takes a while to get from where the transmitter is found. To today, the rig hits the airwaves in its new home on the ham bands. The BT-20A project took about eight years from a combination of learning what was needed to finding the time to do it. Joe Pisani in upstate New York has managed to put his gates on both 160 and 75 meters with very little modification. Most of his time was spent cleaning up and tuning up the rig. A ham who by day is a professional in the broadcast industry is Mike DeRoe, KO6NM. His commercial web page features his latest products, but also has a page called the DeRoseum, featuring classic transmitters like these. <laughs> Mike is often heard on 75 meters from his home near Madison, Wisconsin. And while he pursues advanced audio technology at the office, he also appreciates legacy technology in the form of old broadcast transmitters. Let's take a listen. I'm just going to transmit her nuts. I should collect trains. But I love this crazy stuff. I love my junkyard. We have a nice building for this stuff. It keeps it warm and uh, safe. So it's a lot of fun. I'm not going to bring uh, most of these rigs up into the hand bands. I'll leave them where they are uh, just for historic value. Just get them restored and maybe they'll find a home someday as we slip off the planet too. Selecting a transmitter may involve more than just finding a retired example being put out to pasture. Perhaps do some research.
But finding the old advertising brochures may not tell you whether the rig would be your best project. Gates Radio of Quincy, Illinois, made some of the most popular rigs for hams to put on our shortwave bands, partly because the transmitters are numerous, partly because they're set to go on our frequencies right as designed. Okay, we're, we're going to jump out of here as well, uh, go upstairs. It's time to eat dinner, and uh, the sun is uh, starting to set in the west. Rising in the east sets in the west, right? But it's still 6 o'clock, and it's still a little bit light. It's still fairly light out, and we're liking that uh, much better than those dark, gloomy days of winter. So, anyway, we're going to pass out of here. <laughs> go QRT and say 730-K2-LNU. The Gates BC-1 tunes right through 160. Other transmitters do not move easily from their original design frequency. This 1949 Collins 300G uses variable inductors rather than the more common air variable capacitors to tune the final tank. Doug Hensley, W5JV of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, added a fixed mica capacitor to pad the RF tank and he successfully brought the transmitter up to 160. In other cases, it's easier to modify or actually redesign the RF driver and final tank circuitry to allow the rig to operate beyond its original frequency range. Such an overhaul allows this 300G to operate on 160, 75, and 40 meters all the way through 7290 kilocycles. It's a long way from its original frequency of 1120 AM. It came from WUST in Washington. It's a 250 watt transmitter, and it has uh, four tubes known as an 810 in there. Two of them create the audio, two of them create the signal. And they're about the size of a barn lantern. And they glow in much the same fashion as a barn lantern. A very, uh, almost a white filament that can be seen from behind the plate structure inside the, the glass envelope of the, uh, of the tube. Serial number 33 from WUST is one of two Collins 300Gs modified by Jim Young, W8MAQ, who lives near Cleveland, Ohio. He's a broadcast engineer by trade. Jim also did the conversion of 300G, serial number 22, which came from WYRE, Annapolis, Maryland. WYRE had changed hands, and the new owners needed only a small solid-state transmitter about the size of a microwave oven to produce the same 250-watt signal on 810 AM. Well, the transmitter sat at my place for about eight years before a chance encounter on 75 meters where we struck up a friendship and Jim agreed to work his craftsmanship once again. Another Annapolis radio station had too many old transmitters in their technical room. WNAV had what amounted to a backup to the backup in the form of an RCA BTA-1R. This transmitter, produced through the early 1970s, is among those commonly found on the ham band. The transmitter was one of two that were privately held by an engineer who worked at the station who wanted to be ready with a spare rig just in case. A twin sister to the RCA at Annapolis was somewhat secretly stored at another station near Washington, D.C. Arriving at the other station, we found this transmitter entombed. It was the result of some remodeling by station workers who may not have appreciated they were hiding away a classic. Finally, the transmitter again sees the light of day. Both transmitters have since arrived at the home of a Pennsylvania ham where secret conversion plans are underway. In less than a year's time, word of about 80 secret projects have turned up. Secret because, until now, only a few people really realized there was this much interest in acquiring retired broadcast transmitters, restoring, repairing, and giving them another good run on the ham band. Catch you on the airwaves. I'm WA3VJB from Annapolis, Maryland. So, uh, you know, I don't have any direct experience in doing this. We had a guest on the show, uh, Mike DeRoe, who was mentioned in that video. Uh, who has converted AM transmitters for ham band use. And that's pretty interesting. In fact, uh, uh, our friend Leo Laporte has one of these that, that uh, um, uh, Mike, Mike DeRoe uh, converted for him. I, I honestly don't know if Leo's used it yet or not, but it, it's there. Uh, so, uh, uh, hey, is, uh, is Chris back with us? I'm here. Oh, oh good. good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Chris. That, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that so unit that uh, Leo has, I think. He said they try to use it, but there's too much noise, electronic noise, to be able to receive anything. Yeah, there is. They've they've got a beam uh, antenna on the on the roof there in uh, Petaluma, and yeah, it's it's a very electrically noisy environment. So, what do you know, Chris? About uh, have, have you been asked? Have you donated transmitters? What do you know about using uh, AM transmitters for uh, ham radio use? Uh, I have donated AM transmitters. Uh, some of those in the video, 
uh, RCA BTA models, uh, a couple of GEs. I have not had a chance to do the actual conversion myself, but I have visited folks, friends of mine who are amateur operators with uh, such equipment. It's pretty cool. I mean, you know, you, you can't go wrong with that stuff. It'll it'll work. You can tweak it and force it to do many things and have fun. It's uh, it's an ultimate uh, do-it-yourself, you know, um, <laughs> have fun type of thing. It's, you know, it's not it, for the weak of heart. It, you're right. It's not for the weak of heart. It does involve retuning, and retuning naturally involves uh, having knowledge of how tuned circuits work in the first place. Now, maybe you have, I certainly have um, uh, moved a, an AM transmitter in frequency a little bit. You know, m maybe uh, two, or th two or 300 kilohertz uh, in frequency. So with an older transmitter, that might involve getting a new crystal for it. Uh, a lot of these older transmitters used a crystal that was in a, a heated, uh, you know, an oven assembly to keep it at the same temperature, to keep it oscillating the same frequency all the time. And, and uh, there might have been some little trimmer adjustment uh, for it uh, uh, near the crystal itself. Um, uh, but tuning, you know, moving a transmitter, as they mentioned in the video, some were easier to, to move in frequency than others. Some use an, uh, very, you know, in a few places they would use an air variable capacitor. And that's easy to, you know, turn a little bit and, and get the circuit resonating the, and as it goes through the various amplification stages. Usually it's a two or three amplification stages. And, they all ha and, and, and these usually operate in, um, at least the higher ones, uh, operate in a class C mode. Uh, to which are more efficient, uh, take less power, but they also have to be tuned circuits in order to to work like that. Um, so if you got to move a transmitter by a lot, you might very well be replacing parts, or as was mentioned in the video, uh, padding a circuit with a capacitor. A capacitor in the right place would change the resonant frequency, and uh, typically what you're going to want to do is is make the resonant frequency higher to get it out of the AM broadcast band and into uh, that 160 meter band. They did mention uh, 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 some modifications, uh, one there that went up into the uh, 7 megahertz area. So, um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's quite, a, uh, quite a change from the, from the broadcast band. Well, I, I would say, I suspect if you've got an AM transmitter that was in, say, 1,000 kilohertz up to 1650, you probably had a great chance of you know, moving it up to the uh, 160 meter band and stuff because most of the circuitry is probably broadband enough to take it up there. If you were unfortunate to have somebody give you a transmitter, say, around 560 kilohertz, you probably had to do a lot of, a lot of work on it. But the coils are large, the, the, the room in the cabinet is plentiful, so you could easily build many things and, and adapt uh, necessary changes. Build your own crystal oscillator if you choose, Culpitz oscillator. Uh, it's a lot of good things. It's pretty cool. The hardest part's going to be the antenna array, whatever you're going to drive it into. Uh, yeah, space limited. Yeah. <laughs> space limited. Space uh, limited. I guess the good things about you know they they say a, a, a tube transmitter often. Uh, <laughs> I've heard engineers say that transmitter so, is uh, is so uh, robust I could tune it up into a wet rope. You know, absolutely. Uh, uh, and solid state transmitters. Now, if they're if it's a broadband amplifier, uh, uh, you, you, well, you're still gonna have to match the impedance. Uh, but a, a tube transmitter oftentimes had a pretty wide ranging output uh, tuning and loading control, so you could match the the output impedance of of the tube circuit. Uh, to whatever the characteristic impedance was of the uh, antenna. And so if the antenna was coming in and it may have been, who knows, uh, uh, 22 ohms uh, at, you know, plus J50, well, you could, uh, you, you could, you could use those controls to, to uh, uh, swamp out the J and match the, the R and, and get a, a good match between the, the transmitter and, and the antenna. Well, one thing that always amazed me, you know, in, in, the, in the broadcast world, we tend to consider uh, that we have to have a very, very low uh, standing wave ratio, okay? Often, often called a VSWR, Voltage Standing Wave Ratio, or VSWR, uh, as it's pronounced. In, in broadcast, especially FM broadcast, you know, we wouldn't put up with, uh, with a, a 1.2 to 1 uh, VSWR. Uh, you know, it would have to be very, very low for, for our purposes in, in, in uh, on-air broadcasting. But for ham purposes, it seems as though in that world, you don't mind. Uh, you're not going for ultimate audio quality. You're not always going for maximum power transfer. You're going to for a situation where you can tune the antenna and the transmitter as best you can and talk to somebody. Am, am I right about that, or am I off base? No, you're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, you, you set your, your VSWR, your VSWR, to where you need to function and get the best ratio of power transfer, I'll call it. 
And I did an experiment once years and years ago with a, um, I think it was about a 10-foot wooden dowel pole and then about 50 or 75 feet of a zip cord, wrapped that around it to create a coil, and at the top of this wooden pole, vertically, we placed a 102-inch CB whip. Oh, and gosh. we uh, tuned this sucker to operate around 1620, 1630 kilohertz or 1.63 megahertz. And it actually worked. We uh, attached it to a fence, <laughs> uh, a, a, a cyclone type fence, you know, metal fence, created, uh, that was the ground plane, a couple of uh, radials we stuck out, and pumped about 200 watts into it and got ourselves about two to three mile coverage. Just an experiment. We were just experimenting with what if. It was a radio station. What if we had to abandon our transmitter site and, re and set, some, set up somewhere else? How could we do it? So I had read an article about some military stuff doing you know, ad hoc, low frequency antenna design, trying to do stuff in confined spaces. So we gave it a try. So along with that thinking and a nice broadcast transmitter operating an amateur band, you got yourself a really powerful little package. You know, typically when you have to lash up a temporary antenna, uh, the the usual problems are that it's too short, and it's uh, not vertical to the ground, and you may not have a good uh, ground plane under it. So you may it may not be located where the ground radials of your tower used to be if, if you had a tower. I, I've dealt with tornadoes taking towers down and thunderstorms taking towers down, and I think maybe a pickup truck backing into a guy wire that took a tower down, and have had to you know lash up some kind of of AM uh, uh, an antenna. And I've had, uh, you know, not really knowing all the fundamentals of what I was doing. I didn't have the best of results. But in each case, we got the transmitter back on the air at some power level, at least half of whatever it was before. And so, yeah, we, you know, still provided coverage to the, to the town in question. But oftentimes the problem to the transmitter is that the impedance presented by this temporary antenna is going to be too low. You know, not often do you have the problem where the impedance is, is high. And, of course, the transmitter probably wants to see 50 ohms. Also, a lot of you know, solid-state transmitters may have no tuning network at the output of them. So you may have to provide them with 50 ohms, however you can do it, uh, external from, from the transmitter. So uh, the, the, you know, the, the characteristic impedance of the uh, lash-up that you provide you know, may end up, end up being quite low on you know, 2 to 3 or 10 ohms, you know, something much less than 50. So it's going to have to get uh, impedance transformed down quite a bit, which may involve uh, a, a T network and an L network. Um, so we should go into this sometime when, when somebody really knowledge, knowledgeable is on the show about, about designing such networks. Hey, and that gives me a good opportunity to uh, mention that at the NAB show, there was a forum that the, uh, uh, the FCC put on about the future of the AM radio band. And this is a pretty hot topic. Uh, it's, it's really easy to uh, stir the pudding, so to speak, because everybody has an opinion. And so in the next few weeks, I've got a couple of guests lined up for twerk that are going to be really interesting. Uh, one of them is uh, a fellow by the name of Watt Hairston. Yes, his name really is Watt. That's his given name. <laughs> and Watt, Watt has been an engineer in the South specializing in AM uh, for years and years, uh, and and good guy. He lives uh, he lives just outside of Nashville. I've known Watt for years and years, and he's got a lot of experience. This guy is, uh, well, I guess, what you'd call sage experience. He has been there and done that in just about every AM situation, and um, uh, we're going to hear from Watt. And I just talked to him today. He couldn't be on the night, but he'll be on a, on a future show. The other person who we're going to have on as a guest, and this is going to be fun because this guy stirred the pudding is Glenn Walden of, um, is, he's at CBS now, right, uh, uh, Chris? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. Senior VP of Engineering for CBS. Senior VP of Engineering. So Glenn is going to come on and talk about essentially what he talked about uh, at the uh, FCC forum on the future of AM radio. And that got a lot of people hot. Uh, so um, I think we'll, we'll hold off. Unless you want to say something about that, I'm going to hold off until we actually get Glenn on as to what he's going uh, have to have to say and suggest. Oh, no, my only comment is, um, I think Tom Osinkowski was quoted as saying, AM has to remember its strengths. That's all. But we'll have plenty to talk about. It's, You're right. Uh, in fact, I, I, just came, I had that. I, go ahead. I just came from a symptom meeting. Uh, uh, that's why I'm out here on location. 
uh, and the Simpty meeting was about the uh, NAB wrap up, 25 things you may have missed. And they were talking primarily, yes, it's video, Simpty is video, post production, archiving stuff. But one of the interesting things with uh, one of the, uh, the speakers is they were mentioning how broadcasters in general need to look at how the landscape is changing. And one of the mm -hmm. things they said is, you know, we're content creators. Look at your strength, whether it's, you know, AM, FM, TV, what can you do? And don't assume that the IT or IP world is the end all solution. Maybe what you need to do is now look at it as a hybrid. I thought it was pretty cool. I, it was interesting. It was just pointing out that a lot of folks keep still have their heads in the sand. Well, you know, we, we don't have to be uh, all promotion and, and, and no content right here on, on this show. I get, I, I, I'll go ahead and, and talk about, I don't necessarily, you know, I don't have a, a plan or a future, but let's, let's look at what are AM's strengths. Um, is long distance transmission a strength anymore? It used to be, you know, uh, Station in Cincinnati, I used to listen to a lot. WLW at night, they cover. They claim they cover 38 states. They had the Truck and Bozo show for years and years, and uh, you know, over the road truckers would would listen to WLW for uh, you know weather information and traffic and uh, you know country music and whatever enter entertainment like that. And is there still you know? It, it's a romantic thought. Most of us as engineers grew up. You know, first of all, we bought a little radio and uh, an AM radio and we listen to WLS from Chicago or some New York stations uh, or uh, or WSB in Atlanta or uh, KOA you know in Denver it, who knows where they were depending on where part of the country you lived in I suppose uh, and and that that's that's a brings back good feelings so we as engineers and as uh, I guess people around uh, our age my age a little younger a lot older uh, like to think that that should continue and that's a nice thought I um, I'm not so sure that it's the best use of the spectrum and of our technology to have that continue. Um, uh, things like the, the the general noise level from all these appliances and fluorescent lighting and CFL lighting and you know that kind of thing. Uh, uh, computers. The the world is a much electrically noisier place than it used to be, and so receiving an AM signal, even in a good location, is is a a, a, a you know, magnitude uh, much more difficult now than it used to be. Hey, one of the proposals is let all AM stations go way up in power from where they are now, and they'll just interfere with each other more, uh, but they'll overcome, you know, a lot of the man-made noise. Uh, does, does that idea have merit? I, I suppose it could. It does mean that every broadcaster on AM who wants to go up in power will have a bigger transmitter. They'll have to replace parts of their antenna system probably, and they'll have a much bigger electric bill. Is that where we need to go? Uh, I, you know, uh, it doesn't sound good to me, but maybe that is where we need to go. Um, there is the idea of migrating some stations, maybe the little the troublemakers, the ones that are causing interference to others, uh, into some other channels that might be analog FM or it might be digital. Uh, of course, the worry of anybody anybody who is asked to or is forced to move somewhere else, the worry is: will there be receivers for that area? We've talked about taking TV Channel 5 and or TV Channel 6, um, moving the TV stations that are still on there or mitigating around them and moving AM broadcasters in, as FM stations in, into those frequency bands, um, uh, thereby cleaning up the AM band and giving these people a place to go. But there aren't any receivers for, that, for you know, TV Channels 5 and 6. So, uh, you know, what, what does that leave us with? Uh, do we make everybody on the AM band go digital, uh, go HD? Uh, you know, that, that doesn't sound like a, a good market solution. And, and if we have to pay the, you know, the prices uh, that are charged for HD, a lot of stations can't afford that. So, man, you know, where, where do we go with all this? Do we, uh, some people have said, well, hey, if you make a change, what about the AM broadcaster? You know, he needs protection uh, for from his, for his signal, that's uh, that's part of what he bought when he bought the license, and uh, you know I own a uh, an AM station. I, I don't want to see it its demise, but I also realize that you know the, the the band isn't as useful. If you ask, if you ask um, so many people, not everybody, of course, you can't say everybody. I don't know. So many people say I don't listen to AM anymore. My kids don't listen to AM anymore. I went to a car stereo place to install a stereo. I asked them how, uh, how the AM reception would be, and they said nobody listens to, to AM anymore. Um, the quality of AM receivers have just I, apparently gotten really pathetic. And, and FM receivers, to a large extent, are fairly pathetic too. Uh, 
you know, manufacturers of radios are concentrating on perhaps other things, MP3 playback or uh, some kinds of, of digital services or, or you know, decoding a, a stream that comes from who knows where, you know, what, what method that it comes from. Uh, my, the stereo I have in my car right now, it, it's fine for FM. It's not very good for AM anymore. And, um, uh, but they've put a lot of work into the Bluetooth and the iPod connectivity. Um, so it, it does those two things very, very well. It has a CD player in it, too. I'm not sure how many people play CDs anymore. So, man, it's just so many factors going into this. And uh, uh, I, I, I really think that it's a, it's a pretty clear argument that the AM band, because of man-made noise, is less useful now than it used to be. And people expect a higher quality of audio than we get from AM. We could get higher quality from AM, but we don't because of a lot of factors that have happened over time. I've gone on a long time. Chris, if you're still there, why don't you uh, add to my nonsense? Oh, I, I would say this. Um, AM as a medium, the AM frequencies, the modulation scheme, is, probably lim is definitely limited and is, phase is on its way out the door. What I would do if I was fortunate enough to have an AM signal and be an owner, an operator, I would take advantage of what's going on. Mobile is now becoming the number one method by which people consume. So while you still have the AM signal, people still can find you and you can legitimize who you are, start investing in the IP delivery world. Take for instance, GFQ Network. GFQ Network does not appear on a satellite distribution channel, does not appear on a television network, does not appear on a radio network, but yet it has eyeballs, has ears and people that participate, listeners or, or viewers who are engaged, and it's a totally IP. I can pick it up anywhere I'd like, on my mobile phone, in my car, if it's, if it's Wi-Fi enabled. So why shouldn't AM stations do that? They put the money there. Continue doing AM as it is, because that's your credibility factor. That's how you can remember, remind people. And just migrate. Start developing those websites. Start developing streaming technologies that make sense and work with manufacturers to push it. You know what? Emmis and the gang were so hot to put FM chips in phones why not work on some other means of IP delivery? Don't put a chip in there and say, hey, we're an IP signal, let's find a way to make it work. You know, H.265 is coming. That's a very high-powered video product, video and audio. Why not? That's how I look at it. I, there's no way you're going to migrate an AM band of stations to another frequency, like you said, and receivers that don't exist. There's no way you're going to get uh, maturity or, or saturation in a timely fashion for any return on investment. If I, if I was an owner, I'd be investing in IP. That's what I'd be doing right now. Find out how you know, I get those, yeah. those people to do it. You know, it, it just occurred to me, I, I've got FM radio in the car, and yet when I get in the car, I tend to connect my car radio by Bluetooth to this, uh, this Samsung uh, Galaxy Note 2 and catch up on podcasts that I want to catch up on. And it just occurred to me, I, you, you said that AM broadcasters need to get Get on streaming, make sure they're streaming, make sure that it's a low friction, that there are low friction ways to to get that that stream signal. And perhaps then advertise the heck out of it. Use your use your what's left of your big voice on the AM band. And realize I'm not speaking for everybody because there are plenty of markets or several markets where AM is still huge. Um uh, I, I don't know the latest of what's going on in San Francisco, but you know, for decades, even though FM was more popular in in many markets, uh, uh, you uh, you had a situation where in San Francisco and in Seattle, uh, AM uh, was still king for a long, long time. I'm sorry, I don't know if it still is. Here, I just realized here's a here's the TuneIn Radio app, okay, and these are the stations that I've put in as my favorites. And look, um, man. I, it just occurred to me, I haven't listened to these stations on the radio in probably a year or two. I think maybe I tuned into Super Talk WWTN here in Nashville uh, on the car radio. Uh, here's a, a few more. Uh, Lightning 100, that's a station here in Nashville, uh, plays AAA format. And they're a little hard to pick up. They're, they're a 3,000 watt FM. Uh, GFQ Network, I listen to them. There's my own station, V103 in American Samoa. There's the Twit Network, uh, 93KHJ, which is my station in American Samoa. And it's just occurred to me since you said that, Chris, that that's how I'm partaking of radio nowadays. Um, that's really in I, I, it, it, it had not occurred to me that that's what I'm doing until you said that, but that's what I'm doing. Wow. Um, go ahead. 
That's what I'm talking about. I Listen, I worked for a broadcast group for many years, and we were trying to figure out ways of extending, I'll use the terminology, extending the brand beyond its signal. And unfortunately, because most broadcasters have their head in the sand, can't get their head around what's going on, we did not get to do a lot of things that we proposed. One of them was putting the content we did up on a stream or make it available as an on-demand product, but make it timely. It was perishable product. So in the morning, you got what you needed because by the time the afternoon came, that material aged and now was refreshed. Nobody wanted to do it because the phrase was, we don't want to cannibalize our money cow. The reality is the cannibalization is taking place not because of you, but because of yeah. lack of action. Think about it. You're not cannibalizing yeah. anything. Yeah. People already come to you. You're extending what, you, what they experience to what they're comfortable with. Hello? There are other industries that do that on a regular basis. Broadcasters have to wake up. TV is starting to come around the corner with that. With TV everywhere, the set, what they call the second screen, they're now starting to go in that direction. ABC Television Network has now decided they will use the technology to allow you to see the local stream, the local content on the stream. Okay? So it, it's starting to get there. But AM and FM broadcasters have to wake up and realize that's what you got to do. And you can do CBS Radio Player, iHeart Radio, my mother's uh, tuna box, whatever. It's not going to work because it has to be ubiquitous. People have to be able to get what they want without some special front end. You'll see. It will be non-broadcasters, non-traditional broadcasting that will make this happen. You know, um, uh, I've been, um, I just can't. I shouldn't say too much. Here's a here's a report that came out of. Uh, uh, sorry, I ac accidentally <laughs> hit the play button here. Uh, a report came out of the folks at Triton Digital, and you know, Triton's a company that has uh, collected up uh, several other streaming companies and putting it all under under one roof. Uh, they measure internet audio listening for pure play streams and for streams of broadcast radio stations. Chris, this term pure play, I want to make sure I understand what this term means. Can you tell me what that means? Oh, good question. That has so many connotations. I, ah. I, in the way that Triton, I think, to, talks about it, I believe it's literally people st starting a, a stream, going all the way through everything it has, and starting another. I've been told I, several different things. I, well, I wish I, I, could I, give I always straight answer. I see the term in contrast always to broadcast radio stations. So I would imagine a service like Soma.fm. Uh, would be considered a pure play. Uh, Pandora would be a pure play. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, that would make sense. Yeah. I guess people that aren't streaming their radio station are what you'd call pure play. If I got that wrong, maybe somebody can uh, let me know to clue me in in the chat room. Anyway, so Triton uh, measures internet uh, listening, and Triton, you know, they're a very large company. They serve up a lot of streams at the same time for broadcasters and non-broadcasters. They say mobile streaming audio listening, mobile like this, accounted for 56% of all audio consumption. Now, I guess that's of their streams in March. Uh, that compares to 46% for 2012. So it's gone up uh, 10 points, 10% uh, 10, 10%, if you will, but 10 points uh, in, in one year. So I, more and more people are streaming using audio, and uh, you know, hey, as 4G becomes much more ubiquitous, uh, that seems like that's that's what's going to happen. Pandora began capping mobile listening at 40 hours per month in March. During that period, Triton saw a 23 percent increase in pure play internet audio mobile listening and 5 percent increase in broadcast internet stream listening. Sounds like the pure plays are gaining ground faster than the broadcasters are, according to that figure. Um, well, they are. Now, they are. Yeah. Um, now, I, you know, personally, hey, most of the things that I listen to, most of the things that I, I've got on my list of favorites are broadcast stations. Uh, well, a few of them are mine, but hey, there's one that was kind of interesting. Uh, 105.2 Radio SVH in uh, Latvia. Uh, I like listening to that station. They're kind of fun. And But right below that is another one of mine, uh, WKXY in uh in Cleveland, Mississippi. Um, but yeah, there certainly are things I listen to that aren't broadcast, but I guess most of the ones that I've got saved as favorites are radio stations, stations that I've known and loved for, for years and like, like, still like the personalities that are, that are on them. Um, so here's some more stats. Overall, Pandora still tops listening data for March, two months ago, with about 905 million, that's almost a billion in one month, session starts. So people who start 
playing some Pandora stream. Uh, 1.85 million average active sessions, so uh, I guess that's for Pandora. Clear Channel comes in number two at 138.6 million starts, and that's, man, that's like 14% of what Pandora has. Um, and Slacker comes in number three with 34.7 million starts. Cumulus number four with 19.5 million, and CBS number five at 21.5 million uh, and averaging uh, 70,000 or almost 71,000 active sessions. What do you make of those numbers, Pandora being so huge? Well, I, I would say Pandora and others make it. It's, um, it's on demand. People are building what they want, and they're listening to it and enjoying it, and that's what it's about. I, like I said, I came from a Simpty meeting just uh, what an hour ago, and they were talking about how on-demand video is becoming the new, the new thing. It's no longer... Uh, you know, people watching video at a certain time of day, or you know, there's a name for that phrase. I can't think of the phrase of it at the moment. It's now become on demand. So, I can see Pandora and others doing you know, doing exactly that. That's why I'm saying broadcasters have to look at what they've got and expand it, expand the brand, or extend it. Don't think of it as like, oh, we're cutting into we're cannibalizing. No, make the if you have an FM, continue doing your FM, but now expand the horizons. Give the audience a choice. Get creative with some demand stuff. Be more creative with how you package that music. If you're a music intensive station, if you're sports news or uh, talk, then you know figure out a way to kind of you know to capitalize on that. There's a lot of stuff people could be doing. They just we're stuck in the traditional thinking. We we are we are stuck. But you know what? I mean, there's a there's a place for legacy and there's a place to move on. Let me ask you this, Chris. I, I got to tell you, back in 1980 or 81. I was talking to some guys at the local cable company in the town I lived in, and I asked them about how, what percentage of households did they have as customers. And they said they had about 75%. That, that seems like pretty high penetration, but back in 1980, they had 75% of the houses they pass with a, with a cable signal were their customers. Now, I thought, well, gee, what's going to happen when it's 80%, 85%, 90%, 95%, at what point does it make sense for TV broadcasters to say, you know, we're spending uh, $13,000 a month of electricity and uh, you know, another $20,000 a month electricity on, I mean, on the uh, tower rental um, and upkeep and all that, hmm, and a transmitter engineer, when's it worthwhile to turn that transmitter off and just be on the cable? You know, if it takes you know, fiber or whatever to get out to, uh, to remote cable head ends. At what point do you turn off the TV transmitter. At what point is it just not worthwhile to run all these things? We've probably reached that point now. It's just that we're holding on to it because of the, the business models we're, we've built around it. I mean, think about yeah. this. Let's say I'm here in New York City, and we've had several major crises where outages from power, from natural, uh, what do you call it? natural disasters have occurred, and the one thing that was the shining light during all that were over-the-air television. That's all well and good. However, yeah. how many people had receivers that could be used? Probably, maybe, you know, what, 5%. So, you know, the industry has to start realizing that, you know, it's either you shift, find a way to encourage over-the-air reception with something else. I don't know. I, I just wish there was an easier way, but I don't think there will ever be. Now, I got to point out, and, and uh, Swamp Rat in the, in the chat room says, hey, if they cut off the TV transfer, they lose me as a viewer. And you know what? I've seen more of that since television in the U.S. went to HD. They turned off their analog. I think there are probably more people on rabbit ears now than there were before the HD conversion. And I think part of that is driven also by the incredibly high price of cable TV in most places. My cable TV, I think, is just outrageous. And, you know, we watch four channels uh, that are delivered by cable. So, uh, you know, I if, if Congress may mandate a la carte pricing, okay, fine. But you know what? Comcast and Time Warner and these guys, they still they have to make a profit. They have to. Maybe they don't have to make what somebody would call an exorbitant profit. Uh, maybe they can you know, make less of a profit. I don't, maybe the rates for Internet would go way up. I don't know. But if, if, if Comcast all of a sudden uh, trims the bill of everybody who goes with a la carte by 50%, uh, which would suit me great, but you know, what's Comcast going to do to continue to build facilities and keep my uh, my internet really fast and and double my speed every now and then? And and uh, you know, how's that going to affect the business, the services that were delivered? I I, I don't know. Uh, you know, 
people who are uh, people who uh, some people would say, oh, they make tons of money. Well, they do make tons of money. But other people say, yeah, but they reinvest a lot of that money back into the in, into the infrastructure. I don't know. I, I don't know exactly you know how they operate, but I do know that if Comcast, Time Warner, and other cable companies don't operate at least at a profit, then it becomes uninteresting as a business. You're right. You're absolutely right. And I don't think all that card's going to happen anytime soon because um, they're basically cutting into the uh, the profits. You know, the reason they are where they are today, cable the cable industry, is twofold. One, they've been subsidized by the government for years, and two, they've been able to just basically lock you into packages. And you know, for 120 dollars a month, you get you know 400 channels, but you only watch five. I don't care as a cable guy because you're paying me 120 a month. And then you have the must carry, uh, the carriage uh, pricing. You know, if I'm a local broadcast company or an entity, I pay to have eyeballs, I pay for access, or they pay me. It's like the whole model is designed to just basically feed people the handouts, the businesses. It's going to change. And I think that's why IP, IPTV, is screwing up yeah. everything for everybody. You know, <laughs> screwing up in, the in a good screen, way or a bad way? No, it, well, it screws up everybody, those of us in business who are trying to hold on to, as you pointed out, the old model. But yeah. it's, it's doing a wonderful job for folks of, uh, like our audience on GFQ. Our audience on GFQ, you know what? Probably 80% of them, oh, I'll be honest. No, no, I'll be fair. 50%, I bet you, don't even have like full-blown cable packages. They're probably yeah. getting everything they want now on Netflix. Oh, that's right, Netflix. Have you noticed lately Netflix has gone from being a DVD slash streaming rental service to original programming and yes, then taking programming yes. from other content providers and now playing it back, you know, um, that's interesting, like Arrested Development has a great following, but they're following yeah. it on Netflix, not the original network that brought it out. Why? Breaking Bad. I mean, think about it. Yeah. And that's what's going on. And there are a few folks, I guess I'll call them content creators in the video world, that have missed the boat, haven't gotten on that bandwagon, and now we're running scrambling trying to figure out how do they get their stuff out there the same way. How come we as TV guys? How, how come we as radio guys like to talk about TV and how they ought to fix their business model? Because it's easy. Because radio is very straightforward. <laughs> radio, radio has got it made. They're just not doing it. TV impacts everybody's life because we're in a visual world. I'll tell you, radio stations. There have been. I've traveled the country and I've heard a few stations and watched the. I'll call it a multimedia uh, element, the, the web and, and whatever else you want to call it. There are some stations that really have got it figured out. When I talk to the managers or the owners of the place, they're doing very well. Now, granted, it's a microcosm of what's out there, but they're doing very well. So, you know, it's not impossible to do. The problem is, you know, you're a large corporation. Say you're a $3 billion corporation and someone tells you, look, you're going to have to consider changing your model because things are changing out there and you can't continue the way you're doing it. Well, who's going to be the first one to step up and say, you're right, boss. I'll go out there and pioneer that new approach. Do you have any guarantees it's going to work? No, yeah, you're not going to yeah. do it. And I guarantee yeah. you that's what's going on right now. And there have been a lot of folks who have tried to do stuff, but they use the traditional approach rather than out-of-the-box thinking. It, it, it is interesting how when one company out of the pack you know, steps out and does something different, uh, it's a big risk. And a good, I think a good example of that is in the cell carrier industry, uh, T-Mobile. You know the the fourth small, yeah. the, you know the the fourth in line and size wise of the four big carriers in the U.S. Anyway, uh, has gone to a plan where you end up paying basically less for your plan and more for the phone. Now they they've kind of fixed that by. Uh, financing the phone for you. It, it, it's, it's transparent this way. I like that. I like transparency. You, f you can pay all at once for the phone or they'll finance it for you at no finance charge uh, across the two-year contract. Either way, you're paying for the phone. Uh, either way, you're paying full boat for the phone uh, as opposed to uh, you know one of the other carriers where you pay 100 bucks for what is really a $600 phone and then you end up, you know, paying a high monthly tab for the, the service. Either way, it's probably about the same. I just kind of like the transparency. My point is this. Uh, I went to several T-Mobile stores about the time that they started this. I just happened to be walking by a couple of them, and I went into one to switch out some phones. And the stores were busy. People were liking this idea. Now, some people were in there to get the iPhone that's now available on T-Mobile. But people liked this. And... People are liking Netflix, right? That's a good example of something that people are going to. The, despite their faux pas uh, a couple of years back with the DVD thing, and um, uh, the, you know, the CEO admits that was, that might have been a mistake, uh, still they're, they're, they're back doing well again. 
interesting uh, to see what's going to happen in radio. Who will step out? Who already has stepped out? I mean, is is iHeartRadio an example of stepping out and being forward out there? I know Clear Channel no. put a lot of work into iHeartRadio, and they still are. They have content creation. They got graphics and and you know artist stories and just a lot going on there. I, I just I haven't gotten around to partaking much of that. I've I've sampled it a few times. Uh, is that the the direction where? Uh, where stations are going to go. Has Clear Channel already stepped out to do something? No, I wouldn't say it's stepped out. All they do is create an ecosystem they control, they can yep. monetize in their own way, world. But let's face it, if I want to listen to some stream, I'll, I'll call it radio station on the iHeart network, I've got to go through their app, which means I now have to break the model that I'm accustomed to with my phone, the way I'm yep. doing things, and now I'm locked into that. No, that's wrong. That would be like the GFQ network deciding, you know what, you can watch and listen to our shows, but you're going to have to download an app in order to do it. How fast ah, do you think yeah, it'd be a rebellion? Yeah. Okay. Let's use that. You know, I got, I got to, one thing that I really like, I would love to see, and I'm told this may be in the works. Um, that's probably all I should say. Okay. The, the, some people like Stitcher. Some like, I happen to like TuneIn. I just, the, you know, the, the way it works just kind of fits, fits the way I like to, to play with, uh, with a, uh, an app. What I would like to do is be able to go to an app like TuneIn or Stitcher or maybe an app called Radio or something, and and then have if I choose a station, then have my experience in that app controlled by the station after I've chosen it, not before, but after. So when I choose a station, then I get whatever rich content that station chooses to give me within the framework of say a TuneIn or a Stitcher app. Does that sound reasonable? Actually, it is reasonable, and I have seen that two, where was I, two radio stations' websites did that. I wish I could remember. It was about a year ago, or two years ago. I actually visited a radio station. All right, we're a little shy on Chris's uh, audio for the moment, so um, Talk uh, we'll to come them back. To what? Oh, no. Oh, go ahead, Chris, you're back. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Well, I'm on LTE, Verizon, and I'm watching the signal strength go up and down. So that's probably sure. why my bandwidth is... Cheap. And there's a few other people around you using the same cell site. Well, let's see. We've got about two, three, oh, there's a huge party over there. Probably, yeah, I'm sure. But LTE is supposed to be able to handle that. That's the way it's designed. Yeah. The, the uh, Internet Multimedia System, the IMS backbone. Uh, but in any case, which, to your point of, of uh, an experience controlled by the radio station once you're in... There was a radio station I visited a year ago, or two years ago. They were working on that. They were doing stuff in that fashion, a very, very high level, high altitude, cursory approach. That would make sense. I think that's probably a better way to go. Now you're engaging the audience. You now you know, work with them on what they want, and they get feedback, which is it's like being at a concert, and the musicians are not just playing, but they're playing with passion and, and working off the vibe from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, you're so here. So, so the other, th you know what? We, I got one more subject to cover in this. It's kind of interesting. We, we went from really old technology, old AM transmitters, to where, and I'm, this is something we're so passionate about is what's the future of radio? What's the future, I should say, of content delivery for traditional broadcasters? You know, if you're a non, if you're a, if you're a GFQ network. If you are not that anybody could ever be Andrew Zarian, but if if you want to start your own audio or video network, you're going to be using all these new tools. You're going to be using these new ways of getting out to people. But if you're a traditional broadcaster, you're not so tuned into that yet. Some are, some aren't. Uh, a lot of stations are doing what my little station is doing. Yes, we have a, a feed, on, a, a stream on the net. We're not part of any, you know, fantastic apps. We're not part of any social app infrastructure yet. Uh, if they, if it's something like that costs us money, doggone it, we haven't got the revenue to to do that. Um, you know, is that going to be our death knell? Well, for some people, it might be. If you can't afford to play, then you're going to go away. Yeah, just pull it. And I don't know it. So. Uh, if broadcasters, you know, may may suffer because uh, they're still holding on to the traditional broadcast method. Now, by the way, I've heard something this past week that just drove drove this home. The traditional broadcast method, a transmitter and receivers, technologically, that is a really good way to get content out to people. It just may not be at the viewers or listeners' uh, discretion and, and time frame. 
you know, you may want to time shift what 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 uh, what the broadcaster is sending out. But as far as an efficiency model of uh, of of you know uh, uh, being an efficient use of resources, man, it really is. Um, and if you want to notify a whole bunch of people at the same time of, of something, well, that's a great way to do it. You know, having your cell phone, uh, you know, get called by or send out data packets to, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people in a metropolitan area to warn them of something, uh, that, that takes time and backbone and, and uh, a, a spectrum. Whereas a, a broadcaster, granted, people have to be tuned to it, uh, can get that done instantly with what they're already using. So anyway, just, uh, just some more pluses and minuses to the whole thing. Hey, we've got to take a break. It'll remind you that you are watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 167. Help me out here, chat room. We'd like to get a title for this here show. So you might want to pop it in the chat room. Go to gfqlive.tv. And, uh, and by the way, if you're watching this on a replay, hey, why don't you join us live? You can do so on Thursday evenings in the U.S. at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 Central, and 5 Pacific Time. Figure out your time somewhere else in the world. I'm sure you have to all the time anyway. And uh, check out GFQ Live. Watch it there, and you can participate in the chat room and, and talk with us while we're doing the show and, you know, be our brains. Um, so we need a show title. Our show is brought to you by the folks who employ me. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to tell you about Telos and Omnia and the products that they have for generating streams. Since that's what we're talking about, good point to do it. We, um, we had an interesting, interesting conversation around the company uh, probably uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago. Which is better for streaming, software or hardware? Because you can do it either way. And, in fact, I was in a meeting just yesterday um, where that subject came up. Which is better for streaming, software or hardware? And, of course, the answer is, well, that depends. It depends on what's important to you. Here on the, the This Week in Radio Tech show, uh, about a year ago, we gave away a number of software packages for uh, Omnia AXE. Now, Omnia AXE is a program that runs in Windows XP, Windows 7, 8. Uh, I guess we can run a Windows server. And it's a, um, it's a, it's a service. It's not a program. You access it with, uh, with your browser. It's a service that runs in Windows, and it provides audio processing and stream encoding so that you can take uh, raw audio coming into a sound card or via live wire or however you want to get the audio into the PC, just some way that Windows recognizes. And it will then uh, process that audio properly for uh, reduced bitrate audio uh, encoding. And then we've got a variety of encoders you can encode with, uh, MP3, AAC, uh, HEAAC, uh, HEAAC V2, you know, the, the popular ones that do a great job of getting your, the bit rate down and still having a great audio experience. So Omni AXE does this. Uh, it's a program that costs about $400 at, at list retail price. And uh, if you have a PC, an, an old one laying around with Windows XP on it, bam, you throw Omni AXE on there, uh, you put in the software key, you put your audio in, play with your processing, set your streaming the way you want it, and you're streaming. You can send that stream on to any uh, content distribution network, uh, Live 365, uh, uh, Stream Guys, in, in any of these kind of companies that, that do that for you. Or you could run your own Shoutcast server. Uh, Shoutcast or Icecast, it even works with Wowza. So there's a variety of ways to get that stream out into the general public. So that's one way to do it. Remember, though, you do have to maintain a Windows computer to do that. And if you don't mind doing that, could be that software is the way to do it. The other way to do it, though, is with an appliance, the Telos ProStream. Now, the ProStream, it doesn't run Windows. It runs an embedded Linux operating system. You never have to touch that. Uh, basically, you pull this thing out of the box. You plug it in. You plug your audio into it. You give it an IP address. You choose a preset. You put in some parameters for where the stream is going to go, and you're on the air, so to speak. You're on the net. Uh, it has a built-in HTTP server for confidence monitoring, uh, but it also will send streams to four different locations, and it will encode at two different bit rates. Oh, the Omni AXE will encode at as many different bit rates as your CPU will handle. Uh, each license is for one audio program, but for that audio program can be uh, you know encoded different ways and sent to different or the same place if you like. So two ways to do it: hardware, which I like, it's simple. You plug it in, and it just sits there and works. And then the software ways, which is actually uh, how all my stations are doing it, even though I prefer the other method. Uh, you know, uh, Omni AXE is what we could afford at my little radio stations. And so that's what we're using to uh, stream our audio to the world. Uh, check it out, omniaaudio.com or at telos-systems.com. And you can read all about Omni AXE or the ProStream. 
All right. Moving straight along, you're uh, listening or watching to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 167. And we're going to finish up with Chris Tobin by talking about something that was just announced yesterday. And that has to do with Google. At Google I.O., they announced that Google has thrown its hat into the um, music streaming ring. Uh, it's a service called All Access. It's their music-related subscription service. Um, they are going to play in a crowded field that already includes uh, established services like Spotify and Pandora. Uh, All Access works with music that users purchased in Google Play, combining uh, the two sources into a massive library. So I, I'm not sure why you got to buy some music, but it works with music you bought and I guess music you haven't bought. But it costs. It's $8 a month right now if you sign up now. And about after um, June 30th, it's going to cost you $10 a month. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm having a little trouble seeing how this can be really uh, successful. Okay, Google's behind it, so that means they got lots of eyeballs already. Uh, if you had to pay for it, well, you know, there are, there are free options out there. Um, so, Chris, what do you think? What chances does Google have charging 10 bucks a month? I have two words big data. They don't care that they have, they're going to charge eight bucks a month. They want the data. They want the information that comes out of the subscriptions. And that's what drives their advertising model. Remember, uh -huh. everything you do with Google, you're giving up your privacy. You're giving up a lot of information about yourself. Think about it. Think about yeah, those targeted I, ads they can do with yeah. your emails based on. So that's what I'm thinking. Because you're right. Why would you pay $8 a month for music you get elsewhere and probably for cheaper or free? You know, I. Unless. I, 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 I you're right. You said you give up your privacy to Google. I have already taken pictures of myself in just my underwear and sent those off to Google, so now they've got that too. I, I'm, just, I'm not trying to be a, a crazy person about privacy acts and, and you know the world is coming to an end. I'm just saying, if you look at a lot of the models behind Google and a few other companies, when it comes to online stuff, a lot of it has to do with big data. And that's the, that's the end game. You know what? The entry fee is 8 bucks. So what? And they're going to do other stuff. So what? It's all about the data because the more information they can get about people and their trends, it doesn't have to be exactly your name. It's just your age and all the other stuff. It, it works for them. That's what they do. Look at their model. If you look at the business model, that's how it's functioned. Why do you think they're charging? I mean, it's got, of course, it's got to cost they, them to play you music. Well, they're charging. They're probably charging to pacify or to satisfy uh, the copyright folks of the music, uh, the industry. There's probably that, that's what I, that's what I would think. They don't have an issue with the money. We all know that. Yeah. Uh, my guess is just to, to make it look. Well, you know, part of it may be just to see how it goes, see if people will pay. And who knows? It may end up being free down the road. Uh, it may end up costing more. I don't know. Um, interesting. Interesting. Well, it, it'll be, it, we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much in the, in the Google world, uh, the company I work for. You know, we're on in the whole Google Docs world and, and, uh, I, I don't know how much I'm giving up privacy-wise. I uh, probably a lot, but I can tell you I enjoy I enjoy using all the services. So because if they give it away, back, Chris, we're, you're kind of in and out with us. Maybe you can hear us, but that? we're not we're not we're not hearing you. Is Chris back for a final comment? Guess not. All right. So what do you think? Uh, you know, you're always welcome to go to the, our website, thisweekinradiotech.com, and, uh, and uh, join a discussion there at the end of, uh, of every, every show. I think you can, you can discuss right there. Um, or at the, uh, at the website, gfqnetwork.com. Uh, you can watch our shows there, download, subscribe, uh, and listen as well. Hey, Chris, last comment about, uh, about Google's audio and privacy and what they should or shouldn't be charging. Well, they can charge whatever they like. The marketplace will dictate whether it works or not. They've been known to do stuff and then wrap it up and pull it off the market because they just didn't like what the results were. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, it's a bold move. They're putting a foot in the pond, and they know it's crowded, and they're going to see what they can do. Their name has cachet, and they're going to probably try and capitalize on that too. But I'm just saying, just big data. Watch what you do. Be careful because it's, you know, broadcasters are going to get there. You know, they're going to get blindsided. And all of a sudden, wake up one morning and go, oh, we've lost that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, big data is turning out to be a, a, a big thing. Uh, and yeah. Chris, you're, I, think, I, I think you're right. They could be doing it uh, you know, primarily to get the data. It's just another vehicle 
to get to get the data. Yeah. Do you um, you know, when when I'm look, I do all my email in Gmail. I see the ads all day long, but I don't see them. I and of course I notice that whatever I last looked for on Amazon.com shows up in a window next to my email. Yep. So I, I just bought some bug. You know, it's amazing what you can buy on Amazon. I just bought some bug spray for the house and some of those, you know, pump sprayers to spray it around the house. We got a big house here and I need to, you know, keep the ants out and stuff this summer. And you know, so that stuff's showing up. I looked at some watches on a website uh, recently, and these were gorgeous watches I could not afford. And I'm looking at my email, and bam, there's those watches are just tempting me, tempting me. I'm telling you, <laughs> that's uh, that's what it's all about. That's exactly it. They it follows you everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I do like, you know, that it. On on the other hand, they seem to be ha have things on the ball. I love. I love Google now. Uh, look at this, y'all. I'll get my spectricide bug uh, stuff, and it will uh, bug stopper, and it will be uh, uh, it will arrive next week on Wednesday. The UPS man will bring it. There's my Nashville forecast, nearby events, and stuff going on tomorrow, all right here by just turning on my my phone. So, hmm, am I a tool? Am I being used? Or am I getting value for whatever it is I'm giving up? Great discussion for another show and another day. Folks, we got to go. It is, uh, we've been on the air for a little over an hour. Thanks to the folks at uh, Telos and Omnia for sponsoring, making possible this show. Uh, I really appreciate it. And the products, the Omnia AXE and the, uh, the, the Telos ProStream, audio processing and stream encoding at the highest level. Does a great job. Uh, software or hardware? Yeah, either one you want. Chris Tobin? The best dressed engineer in radio in Manhattan live. Thank you for joining me from Bryant Park. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm pushing the limits of the uh, Logitech webcam with no extra lighting. What you see behind me and around me is uh, basically the backdrop lighting on a wall. It's part of the building uh, next to the park. So and it's been LTE. Well, yes, I, I, saw some, well. I, I, I saw some of what appeared to be headlights on your face a little while ago, and, and that did brighten you up quite a bit. Yes, that was from the garage across the street. There was a uh, truck delivering uh, stuff, turned around and pointed right at us, yes. And I had a TV crew off to my side, pointing that way. Uh, they were doing a couple of stand-ups. It was pretty fun. And uh, to answer the question, or not to, to answer, but to sort of speak to the, you know, your uh, being followed and information, your world is being controlled, just remember this. Retro, we'll go retro for a moment. TV series... I am not a number, number six. I am not a number, number six. Those of you that are movie fans will remember who that is and what TV series, and that was before the internet. And they were talking about controlling what you did. Huh. Okay. Should I, so you're, should, should you're I look, a prisoner. Should I look that up? Yeah, should I look that up? Yeah. Prisoner. I am yeah, not a number. You can look it up. Okay, okay. I will. It's I a will. classic. It's, an, it's one of many of that genre. But yes, we're live on location here in uh, Benton, Manhattan. It's about uh, 76 degrees outside. It's very comfortable. And uh, the steakhouse is very busy across from where I'm sitting. <laughs> and they have, uh, wow, it's a very nice group. Oh, look at that. That's a nice wine bottle. Which, which anyway, steakhouse is that? It's, uh, it's just called STK. STK Patio. Oh. It's an outdoor bistro. And uh, it's, uh, it's really nice. It's <laughs> by, by the way, with, uh, I was Burgers, in New York. Salads, uh, Sammy's. Uh, last week ended up uh, ended up we wanted to go to Del is it uh, Del Frisco's yeah uh, and it was just crowded and you know you can't carry on a conversation in there by the way the, the, the show's done join us next week for this week in Radio Tech bye bye everybody thanks for being with us that's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week another tort has propagated and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind benevolent care we'll be back next week lord willing and the creek don't rise this week in Radio Tech subscribe to iTunes and you'll never miss a show search for this week in Radio Tech in the iTunes store soliciting is strictly encouraged if you like today's show Tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnex Wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off.
Okay. 